Do you know what nemesis means? A righteous infliction of retribution manifested by an appropriate agent. Personified in this case by me. If you read the Bible, Mark, you'd know that there won't be another thousand years. Right now we're in the last days as foretold in the book of Revelation. The last days? You mean the uh, coming of the apocalypse, right? The rapture? You only have to look at the signs. There are wars and rumors of wars. Now, just so the, the rest of us know how much time is left, when is the rapture supposed to hit exactly? Is it uh, midnight New Year's Eve? That's right. Uh, now, is that midnight L.A. time or, or Eastern Standard Time or what? I mean, what time zone has got in anyway? I pray for you all. Good tidings, my beloved true seekers. Welcome to Coffee, Cigarettes, and Gnosis, a district of the Virgil Alexandria where you are safe from the warfare of theists and atheists who believe in the sanity and numbers fallacy. This is your life, don't play hard to get. This is your incessant exploration of the world's favorite and least known heretics, the Gnostics and their brethren in the Esoterica. This is your dark odyssey through the gnashing rocks of orthodoxy upon the seas of fate to the farthest shores. This is discovering who you truly are and what you truly should be, a god in the becoming. As Clement of Alexandria said, self-knowledge is knowledge of God. And as Peter Gabriel sang in the carpet crawlers, you gotta get in to get out. What's gonna happen? Something wonderful. So I'm so happy you've emanated yourself on this July 17, 2007. Make sure you've got some fuel in your cup and some plant substance to burn, whether it be tobacco, funny weed, incense, or just your husband's bed. Why? Because coffee is for closers and we're gonna burn with the astral fire of the alchemist soon enough. You know, this is, excuse me, a damn fine cup of coffee. Or if you want to just lay down in the cool darkness of your bedroom while the world churns in hatred and conflict outside your door and relax until you've sunk into your bed and out of your head. Plato said all learning is remembering. Joseph Campbell said that the life of a dog is a good life but it's still just the life of a dog. And the Gnostics said that the original sin is ignorance. We've been fooled all our lives by the angelic mafia who made us believe that ignorance is bliss when ignorance is just ignorance. It's the hell of hells. There are far worse things waiting man than death. Think about it, but don't think too hard. You can't think your way to Gnosis, that salvific knowledge on so many levels, but at least you've taken the first step and the right step to the treasury of light. And today, to help take another step, we have a wonderful guest. We are joined by Andrew Philip Smith, author of Gnostic Writings on the Soul, The Gospel of Philip Annotated and Explained, and The Gospel of Thomas, a new translation based on the inner meaning. Andrew will guide us into an important myth theme of the Gnostics by taking a safari through two very important scriptures, the Hymn of the Pearl and the Exegesis of the Soul both which he dissects like a kung fu master in his new book, Gnostic Writings on the Soul. Ah, another day, another defilement. As mentioned before, there are four mythemes in Gnosticism. We've got the concept of the Demiurge, the deficient being or cosmic ego that crafted a deficient reality we now reside in like tenants of a slum. See, gentlemen, greed is for amateurs. Disorder. Chaos. Anarchy. Now that's fun! The second one is Sophia or the Divine Feminine. She is the missing equation of the Creator God that has made him ignorant, arrogant, and just plain moody. Much like our own egos. In Gnosticism we know her as Sophia. In Hebrew she is either Chakma or the Shekinah of God. You may also know her as Alice, Mary Magdalene, Eve, Goeth's Gretchen, or Don Quixote's Dulcinea. To put it bluntly, the queen must, is, and will be restored next to her cosmic bridegroom and thus the healing of creation can begin. Mother is the name for God on the lips and hearts of all children. The third mythem is the principle of the savior. We, humanity, and even the galaxies around us can't do it alone or we would have done it a long time ago. 
There are angels who guard a distorted reality, and like union workers they just don't want change. Yet beyond time and space, apostles of light come down from the all, the source, the depths, in order to grant us gnosis, so that we may wake up from the slumber of eternal anxiety. Call him Buddha, Hermes Trismegidos, Aslepos, Simon Magus, St. Paul, or the Gnostic Christ. Call him the knight in shining armor. Call him a she. Call him your higher self, but the results are the same. You are nudged by the Savior who whispers to you, Wake up. Time to live. Time to go home. Time to finally smile without fear. All I've ever known to be true is a lie. And the last mythem is today's topic, and that is the fall of the soul into the sewer of materiality. Once we lived in perfection and endless consciousness, but then we dipped so low and so soon we plunged into the bodies of dead animals, as the poet Yeats said. Perhaps it was because we were chosen as a rescue operation of creation by higher powers. Perhaps we were seduced by Jehovah and his union workers. Perhaps we were just curious. And perhaps we just wanted to know ourselves by interacting with the Kanoma, the emptiness that is the universe. We are star stuff. We are the universe, made manifest, trying to figure itself out. It doesn't matter right now. Here we are trapped and our mission is to rise through the heavens until we are absorbed by Nirvana, or the Ayin in Hebrew, both meaning the bliss of nothingness. This might be the hardest concept to swallow in a society of spiritual materialism and narcissistic overtones. After all, we love our bodies and personalities and bowling on the weekends. We want to stay alive without learning or growing as much as possible, as long as we do stay alive. We think that we are the main character in the divine play that is our lives. But deep down inside we know that we are frauds. Heck, even in my mortal incarnation I fall into this trap. Sure, I like tail and cocktails as much as the next dude, but I understand that before Abraham, I was. There is a spark of eternity inside me, beyond the layers of self-image and flesh and fate. You gotta get in to get out. You gotta know yourself, and that is the scariest endeavor any one of us can take. I never look back, darling. It distracts from the now. Like Jesus says in the Gospel of Thomas, Logan number 22, when you make the two into one, and when you make the inner like the outer, and the outer like the inner, and the upper like the lower, and when you make male and female into a single one, so that the male will not be male, nor the female be female, when you make eyes in the place of an eye, a hand in the place of a hand, a foot in the place of a foot, and an image in the place of an image, then you will enter the kingdom of the Father. You have always been here. And there are no better stories except maybe the Matrix and the Iliad that tell the tale of the fallen soul other than the Gnostic exegesis of the soul and the hymn of the pearl. Both are epic and psychological narrations of the hero and heroine with a thousand faces that leave their homes of homes for different reasons and must face tests that would make even Tony Soprano cringe. I tell my kids, only God can make a life. Andrew will give us a fine exploration of these two scriptures, and even a history of the concept of the soul in Western society. The earliest account we have of the Gnostic fallen soul is probably from the father of all heresies himself and my patron saint, Simon Magus. In his account, the great power, or the true god, the Aletheos in Greek, gives birth to the Enoia, or first thought. She is charged with shaping reality, but is betrayed by the worker angels who crave her power like a frat boy craves a piece after reading Maxine. Did you ever notice how in the Bible, whenever God needed to punish someone, or make an example, or whenever God needed a killing, he sent an angel? Did you ever wonder what a creature like that must be like? A whole existence spent praising your God, but always with one wing dipped in blood. Would you ever really want to see an angel? These angels defile and clothe her in matter, hiding her from the great power. Thus the true God takes on a human form in order to find and reunite with our heroine. She is reincarnated throughout history in order to keep her away from redemption. She is finally known as Helen of Troy or Helen of Tyre. 
Eventually she is located by Simon Magus, the latest reincarnation of the Great Power. Then they are reunited and all is balanced in the cosmos. It seems this is all based on the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, where wisdom herself is personified as a co-creator with God, the true God. Later on, the various Gnostic sects develop more intricate myths over the account of Simon Magus and the fallen first thought of God. Sometimes you have to lose yourself before you can find anything. Now I'd like to read from the Jungian psychologist June Singer's amazing work, A Gnostic Book of Hours which I can't recommend enough. Here she encapsules the notion of the fallen soul much better than I could. The writers of the Gnostic book The Exegesis on the Soul, from which the texts for this hour are drawn, might as well title it The Evolution of the Soul. It is one of those tales of romance and wonder that emerge out of the polycultural scene of Alexandria, probably from the pen of Jewish Christian cosmopolitans who were familiar with the heroines of Greek novels and myths. The Greeks left their mark most strongly on the culture of Gentile Christians, influencing them to idealize the women of virtue while regarding the fallen women with utter disdain. Jewish Christians differed from the Gentiles in their attitudes, for the former had the heritage of the Old Testament in their veins as well as much Jewish apocryphal literature of the centuries immediately preceding and following the time of Jesus. I'm not the Messiah! Jewish Christians wrote of a feminine soul that incorporated all the charm, beauty, and grace of the Hellenic lady, as well as the dark, scheming aspect of the sinful woman of Judaic lore. Among the women of the Bible who acted out the metaphor of the duality of the soul were Ruth, who manipulated, if she did not seduce Boaz, into marrying her. Bathsheba, who was certainly a virtuous woman until King David invited her into his bed the widow Tamar, who played the prostitute in order to seduce her father-in-law, and Rahab, the only one who was a professional prostitute. Believing that the God of Israel desired the ancestral land of his people, Rahab saw herself as representing the fertile ground that was to be given to those who would cultivate the promised land. Every one of these women, despite their transistory loss of her own personal integrity, was able to see the true light when it appeared to her, to purify herself and to become whole again. Is it true when you were born the doctor turned around and slapped your mother? Scholars have suggested that the Gnostic author of the Exegesis on the Soul may have been a woman, and they base this conjecture on the powerfully evocative feelings expressed, which in their minds could have been experienced by a woman. Such intensity wells up from woman's awareness of the sanctity of her own body and from the outrage, shame, and humiliation she feels when her body is abused or defiled. The pain is least of all physical. The wound to her soul causes far more suffering. If the soul is indeed to be thought of as feminine regardless of one's physical sex, we can readily understand the theme and argument of the exegesis on the soul that the feminine is vulnerable because she is pregnable, because she can be entered into and possibly contaminated. The soul is, after all, psyche, and psyche is composed of both mind and emotion. Mind, or intellect, deals with the visible world in a practical way, solving problems, considering issues, and accomplishing what needs to be done to sustain life and to enjoy it. Emotions temper the mind. They come unbidden and exert tremendous power over us, even when we may be unaware of their presence. I am putting myself to the fullest possible use, which is all I think that any conscious entity can ever hope to do. If the Logos, which appears in masculine form, represents an expression of the world of the light, then the Sophia, the soul is feminine form, represent that which receives the word or the light. Her presence is needed for the completion of the divine program, for those who live in the world. To find the lost fragments of the spirit and to know them for what they are, then to liberate them and thereby regain wholeness through them. In this, the soul reaches out to her consort, the Logos. If soul truly means psyche, that tortured, ambivalent aspect of ourselves that reigns over our thoughts, feelings, and behavior, then the characteristics of the soul are set forth in this text are experienced by men as well as by women. Did you see the memo about this? Soul is the archetypal vessel that is given form in order to be able to carry the holy seed, but she can fall upon bad times and be defiled. 
then she must be purified and renewed before she can be restored to the condition of wholeness, or, as it is called in the sacred myth, the condition of virginity. Well, if it's not a personal question, are you a virgin? If it's not a personal question, how much more personal can you get? Stop, piss off! The process of the soul's descent into the depths of the unconscious, its awakening into awareness, and emerges into the light of consciousness is what Jung meant when he spoke of the individuation process. Through such a process can never be adequately described in words, the metaphor of the soul's journey reveals the agony and the glory that attend the experience. This is Coffee, Cigarettes, and Gnosis, and I am Abraxas, and I am done with my drivel. On to the interview with Andrew Phillips Smith on his book, Gnostic Writings and the Soul. They just hire me to drive the car, sir. I'm not here to tell you who you are. I didn't ask you to tell me who I am. You hinting around about clothes. That happens to be a very important topic to me, sir. Clothes, Mr. Banks. Banks. Clothes makes the man. I believe that. You say to me you want to go shopping, want to buy clothes, but you don't know what kind. You leave that hanging in the air like I'm going to fill in the blanks. Now that to me is like asking me who you are, and I don't know who you are. I don't want to know. It's taken me all my life to find out who I am, and I am tired now. You hear what I'm saying? All right, Andrew. Uh, I just wanted to say real quickly, thank you very much for uh, coming on the third time to Coffee, Cigarettes, and Gnosis. It's definitely an honor and a pleasure. Yes, thanks for inviting me. Anytime, and I promise I won't call you a Philip or not, or at least try. <laughs> right. But it's it's very hard because the Gospel of Philip was the first book I read from you, so it's in my head and your middle name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so first of all, I wanted to talk about what exactly made you um, take on the two scriptures of the exegesis of the soul and the hymn of the pearl. I mean, I think it's a wonderful thing because... I mean, how many books on the Gospel of Thomas, Philip, Mary, and Judas can be written? What made you decide to go this route of all the other scriptures? Well, I think the Exegesis on the Soul was um, one of the texts that stood out for me in, in the Nag Hammadi Library. Uh, what I found attractive about it, so it's a very elegant way of expressing these uh, truths about the soul, using the story of the uh, female soul who... Uh, who falls into the body and um, is seduced by uh, thieves and adulterers and whores herself and is eventually redeemed. And I, I like the um, the elegance of it and the uh, way that it was used to interpret the Bible allegorically as well. And the, the exegesis on the soul is from Codex 2, uh, just like the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Philip, uh, Apocryphon of John, Thomas the Contender, uh, pointed this out in one of the introductions in the book that it, it, if we had only found Codex, if we found Codex Two alone, and didn't have the rest of the Nakamadi Library, it still would have been an extraordinary found, find. Uh, the compiler, the compiler of that Codex, uh, had great taste, really. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you might have put there because of importance, uh, or you think that just kind of randomly got there? I think Whatever. there's a, um, there's some selection going on there. As well. I mean, you have it begins with the Apocryphon of John. Then you have Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Philip, uh, Thomas the Contender, the Exegesis, and uh, another one that's not coming to mind. But um, I think it was the origin of the world. Yes, on the origin of the world. Yeah. yeah. There's just, uh, I mean, a lot of them are very accessible compared to a lot of the other Gnostic texts. So kind of, there's a clarity to them, and uh, you know, a popular appeal to them. Um, so the um, the concept of the soul that uh, exists in the exegesis on the soul is one that's common to a lot of uh, Gnosticism, but it's, more, it's expressed more clearly there. There's not such a jumble of mythology and uh, all that kind of stuff that you get in a lot of the other, other texts. It's right. fairly well uh, balanced as a piece of writing. And the Hymn of the Pearl uh, also... Um, it has the same qualities to it. It's a fable. It's a, it's an interesting story by itself, somewhat moving story. It also it expresses uh, similar themes in a different way, but also with this uh, clarity and an, an emotional content that uh, perhaps uh, some of the Sethian texts uh, don't have so much of that, perhaps. 
backing up a little bit before we uh, get our hands dirty with these Gospels, what can you give us a brief account on the evolution of the concept of the soul in ancient times? Uh, you go in depth with it in your book. Uh, yes, but uh, in fact, well, uh, the introduction covers um, the uh, concept of the soul through the various ages, and uh, to me, it's not it's not really a question of development. Um, most of the ideas have been there from the very earliest times. Uh, it's more like theme and variations. You see the same ideas cropping up in different contexts and different cultures. And the uh, Gnostic view of the soul, the body, soul, spirit, seems to be particularly elegant and inclusive to me as a description of the soul and the soul's possibilities. Uh, but it didn't, it didn't pop up out of a vacuum. The it's immediate uh, antecedents were uh, Greek, uh, particularly Platonic thought, and also uh, uh, Judaism, the uh, notion of the soul in Judaism, the soul that can long for God, that added an important element to it. But if we go right back to the beginning, um, of course we don't really know what the earliest ideas about the soul were, but uh, there may have been some similarities to uh, primitive concepts of the soul that were found among prim what we call primitive people. And a lot of work was done on that in the 19th century and early 20th century with the uh, sort of comparative religion school with James Fraser, the Golden Bower. You can see some of the most primitive ideas of the soul. The soul, in some way, represents ourselves. And of course, if you don't have any way of thinking about yourself, the one tends to look outwards for something that will represent oneself. And uh, one way is, uh, um, although people didn't have mirrors, uh, in primitive societies, if, you, if somebody saw their reflection in the water, that reflection is a representation of oneself. And um, so the, uh, the notion that the soul was in the water evolved, that this is something that was oneself, but uh, it was outside of oneself. And as a concept that's called the external soul, the soul, um, by extension, the soul might be thought to exist in a totem animal or in some object that has been consecrated and uh, is uh, thought to hold your soul. So those are obviously very primitive concepts, and they represent an inability to think about oneself, really. I was going to say, you also mentioned that uh, probably even before the Greeks, the uh, Egyptians already had a tripartition of the soul, right? Yes, certainly, yeah. Um, but then we're, we've already got into civilization and... Uh, advanced cultures by then. But yes, the, um, the Egyptians had several words for the soul, and um, sifting through all these different views of the soul, I, I could see three broad categories of soul. But one is the soul as it's associated with the body, um, just the soul is, is the vital force. But there's a difference between a dead body and a living body. A living body breathes, it has warmth, and, uh, other characteristics, whereas a dead body doesn't have those things. And um, so uh, there's a basic notion of the soul as the animating principle. The, the, thing, uh, the soul is in the body when it's alive, and the body is dead, the soul has left. And it's no coincidence that in many languages, uh, the word for soul is the same, or for spirit, is the, is the same as the word for breath. So in Greek, we have pneuma, and I think also psyche was or originally connected with breath. Right. Um, uh, ruach in uh, Hebrew and uh, ruach in Arabic, and uh, so those words mean soul or spirit and breath. In the uh, Egyptian, the range of Egyptian concepts, we have uh, the ka, which is the vital force that animates the body. Then we have the ba, which is um, a little. Uh, the idea is a little more ambiguous, but it seems to correspond roughly to our inner life, the soul as our personality, as our character, as our essence, as who we are as a person. And of course, and this is, uh, you know, if you meet anybody, apart from them breathing, having uh, something that animates their body, they have uh, a distinctive character. Right. And uh, we might call it the soul as internal life, uh, which is mostly the subject of modern psychology. And psychology itself means the study of the soul. So the bar in 
uh, the Egyptian text roughly corresponds to that. I, I say roughly because these terms are never defined clearly for us. We can only work out what they m mean by their context in the surviving uh, uh, funerary texts and pieces of poetry and myths that we have from the Egyptian civilization. And then beyond that, we have the Ak. And the Ak, we could translate roughly as spirit. And this is an, an element of the human being which is divine, uh, which is connected with the divine world, which survives death in a divine way. That's the, um, the third kind of soul that I could identify among these ideas, the, the transcendent soul, the soul of spirit, um, which I believe is connected to religious experience or spiritual or transcendent experience, something that's beyond ourselves as our, or just as our ordinary everyday characters and personalities and that has a connection to the divine. I mean, the Greeks themselves inherited a certain uh, amount of knowledge from the Egyptians. I mean, Plato describes his ancestor Solon going to visit Egyptian priests, being told that the Greeks were infants in, in comparison to the Egyptians. <laughs> and, of course, then um, e Egypt was uh, conquered and Hellenized and uh, is the source for a lot of uh, Gnostic material. Um, I, I want to briefly touch on the contribution of uh, Judaism. In Judaism, the soul, again, it's, uh, it's something which is us, you know, which is ourselves, but the, the soul is defined in the quest for God, in its relationship for God, in the love that it can have towards God. Um, the, the Psalms are a very good example of the uh, relationship between the individual soul and God. And uh, I think even in modern-day Judaism, the soul returns to God. It's not ours. It's something that's been lent to us. So that um, the combination of the um, Greek ideas that came from Plato, uh, Plato had the concept of the, uh, the soul that lost its wings, fell to earth, and yet could rise again. And uh, he also had the concept of the immortality of the soul, um, which is movingly expressed by um, uh, Socrates as he was dying. And he said that he, he believed his soul was immortal after he'd taken the hemlock. Alexander, well, the Hellenistic world around the uh, first century and before that and uh, a couple of centuries after, after that, was very much a melting pot of the Greek culture and the native cultures that belonged to the different countries that had been invaded. And, um, and also in Alexandria was itself was uh, even more of a melting pot. And there was a huge Jewish population in Alexandria. And uh, many scholars believe that uh, Gnosticism may have originated in Egypt, particularly in in Alexandria amongst the uh, intellectual society that developed there. And so we can see um, this combination of uh, the Greek thought and the Jewish thought, that uh, both of which fed into uh, Gnosticism and the Gnostic concept of the soul. And uh, moving on to the uh, two works of your book, Gnostic Writings on the Soul, um, at first glance, it seemed to me almost odd that uh, there are very few Christian tones in both works. Am I missing something, or does this say something about both works, that maybe they're pre-Christian or non-Christian? What is your opinion? Well, I think that's true of the Hymn of the Pearl. I mean, one, one might be tempted to take the uh, prince as a Christ figure, but it doesn't really work. Uh, I don't think there's anything Christian in the Hymn of the Pearl, although it was preserved in the apocryphal Acts of Thomas, right. which itself is, is definitely Christian. The Hymn of the Pearl might be Manichaean. That's a definite possibility. Oh. And it could have just been inserted into the Acts of Thomas. Yes. Well, we have um, dozens and dozens of manuscripts of the Acts of Thomas in Greek and Syriac, but the Hymn of the Pearl is only contained in one Syriac uh, manuscript and one Greek manuscript. So it's likely that it's been inserted at, at some point. I mean, there, there are several um, hymns and set pieces within the uh, Acts of Thomas. So it was easy enough to, uh, it would have been easy enough to insert this. And uh, uh, Thomas recites the Hymn of the Pearl while he's in prison in India in the Acts of Thomas. 
And so it may be Manichaean. Uh, we can go on to that a little bit later. It may also just not have any explicit Chris Christian reference. It's very difficult to pin these things down. So what you said is true of the Hymn of the Pearl, I'm sure. Uh, but there's, there's nothing ex explicitly Christian in it. But I can't really agree about the exegesis on the soul, because uh, there are several um, excerpts from Christian scripture, from the writings of Paul and little bits from the Gospels, uh, that are interpreted allegorically according to the scheme of the exegesis. But uh, you, you mentioned uh, in your notes to me that um, the uh, Jesus isn't called, uh, well, the figure is the Savior, not right. Jesus. That's what yeah. always makes me wonder because, you know, uh, the pre-Christian Gnostics or whatever would call him Savior and never really said Jesus. What do you think is that? It, uh, it's an interesting observation. Um, I'm not sure if I actually picked up on that uh, when I was writing the book. Well, it strengthens my mythicist uh, stance. Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> my Timothy freak that he was, there was a Joshua cult and all that, but uh, who knows? <laughs> well, well, there is um, the scholar Robert Kraft wrote an essay about uh, a pre-Christian Joshua tradition around the turn of the centuries, right? Which is quite interesting. Like I said, I've never quite been able to uh, find the mythicist position. Um, superior to a historical Jesus position, but I, it does cast light on uh, uh, many aspects of early Christianity. Well, my comments on that is that the, um, of course, there is a certain amount of Christian material in the exegesis. I suppose you could argue that it's been added, but I don't know if Henry has really um, gone into that in depth. I mean, there's also a lot of interpretation of the Hebrew Bible, of Isaiah and Ezekiel and that sort of thing in, um, in the exegesis. Why um, do you, what, what school of Gnosticism do you think it's from? I suspect that it's Valentinian because of the um, extensive use of allegory. I mean, so the way that it interprets uh, the little bits of uh, the Gospels and Paul reminds me of uh, Valentinian exegesis. Uh, but that's not definite. I mean, you could almost say... It's just Christian platonic. There's no trace of a demiurge in it. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm happy to let those questions stand in a way. Uh, if somebody comes up with a, an explanation that will convince me, I'll, you know, I'll read it. But um, I, I, I would call it Gnostic. I mean, it does refer to Gnosis in the text. Right, and it seems the, uh, I think one of the giveaways, well, besides the plot, is that it does quote Homer. So what you get is, you know, you can draw that with Helen of Troy, and you can draw that back to the Simonian Gnostics. Oh yes, yes, that's mm -hmm. very the um, well, the myth of the fallen woman, yes, occurred with uh, defiled the, by the, the angels, or the, or the thieves in uh, in the Exegesis. Uh, of course, Simon Magus had Helen with him, you know, his uh, beloved. Helen, who was said to be the reincarnation of Helen of Troy, and going further back um, to be, um, you know, to have fallen from the Pleroma, and to, I mean, in, in that sense, Simon represented a savior figure in respect to uh, the reincarnated Helen, who became a prostitute and was rescued by Simon. So there, there's quite a parallel between the myth of the exegesis and um, the, um, the myth of Simon and Helen there. Um, I, I did have one more uh, comment about the Savior. Sure, go ahead. Um, I mean, of course, it's not just the Savior, it's the Bridegroom as well. Uh, uh, it's which, of course, very the, Christian. Jesus is identified as the Bridegroom in some traditions. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it needn't, it needn't be Jesus. I'm not sure that the Bridegroom is necessarily Jesus, actually. I suppose the Savior is the role that figure takes in the exegesis. In some of the cosmologies, which, for example, those described by... Irenaeus, uh, um, the Savior is an eon, oh. and uh, in, in some of them, the, sa the Savior is a different eon to Christ. I think in one after Achamoth has fallen, which is the Syriac for wisdom or Sophia, uh, it's the Savior who comes down to uh, rescue her, and, and in another, it's Christ who who comes down. 
Right. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that certainly makes a lot of sense. So we've got the basic uh, Gnostic plot. The soul falls from the father's house, and then she's uh, she's defiled. I guess the soul is feminine. And yeah. uh, why is she feminine? I think you uh, and Stephen Heller, Stephen Heller postulated it's because you thought maybe the author was feminine? It's a possibility. I mean, the um, text is certainly very sympathetic to uh, the plight of the soul as a, as a female. And some of the details, I mean, um, the, the soul is promiscuous, but then you know, she has an attack of remorse after the promiscuity. And uh, there's a, there is just gen generally a feminine feel to, uh, to it. The, the female role is identified with in the, in the story. And, and as a counterpart to that, uh, in the Hymn of the Pearl, the uh, protagonist is masculine. And, and of course, though, in terms of ancient gender roles, there are very different possibilities for, for a story that um, involves either a female or a male. I mean, the Hymn of the Pearl, the male is a prince who is sent on a mission. He fails in his mission. He receives a letter reminding him of his mission. And um, then he gathers himself and he proceeds to kill the serpent and win the pearl and goes back to his home country. Whereas uh, the in the exegesis, the female soul is in a much more passive role. And she's reliant on um, the mercy of the father. And then the visit of the bridegroom. And the uh, story culminates in the making love in the bridal chamber which is a very different uh, culmination to the story to uh, you know, the prince being received in his own country again. I mean, I, mean they, I think the two of them cast light, different, a different light on the, um, you know, the same thought, idea of fall or quest you know, and redemption. Uh, that's why, why they make such a good pair together. Going back to the plot, I guess because, as you mentioned, the soul, the fall of the soul is our story. When is the uh, the metanoia, the turning about? How does the soul fix itself? How do we fix ourselves? Um, well, by re realizing our situation. That's the, the first step. And then, um, although this sounds a bit Christian, um, pleading for forgiveness. Um, but I think, I'm sure the realization is the prelude to the metanoia, to the changing of mind. The um, you know the soul sees the situation that she has uh, got herself in um, you know living with thieves and adulterers uh, pouring herself being continually seduced and interestingly giving birth to uh, misshapen children as a result uh, now my my interpretation of all that is psychological uh, as it should be because the uh, female figure represents the soul. Uh, the Gnostic trichotomy, the body-soul-spirit, relies uh, on the soul. The soul is uh, identified with the body in our natural state. The, uh, you know, the body is a part of matter, the lowest level of the universe. The soul just follows the uh, urges of the body, uh, which is just completely concerned with external things. You know, in, in any practical way, it's, uh, our, you know, our needs are food, sex, family, having enough money, but, you know, having whatever right. relationships you want with people, uh, just in the most external sense. And the soul follows all that. Uh, that's the, the fallen soul. and the, uh, It's like uh, Gurdjieff's idea of the many eyes. We consist of many eyes. and th Those are the thieves and adulterers that are drawing us from one, that are seducing us, drawing us from one place to the other. And, and because of those because we um, follow those impulses, and you know, and I don't mean you know that sex is dirty or you know or we shouldn't be uh, earning a living or whatever, but uh, when that when those things completely occupy our lives, then we don't have anything else inside us, and as a result, the you know the further thoughts that we have are like uh, misshapen children uh, or abortions that we're. Uh, giving birth to within ourselves. Although I don't think I even mentioned this in the book, uh, according to some Gnostic schemes, the soul is un under con the control of the demiurge. The, the body corresponds to matter, and the soul corresponds to the demiurge. So uh, we have a, the soul is like a false creation, 
and uh, under the control of a, a false craftsman who, who has created this world, whereas the spirit belongs either to the Pleroma or to the um, uh, Sophia or Achamoth, who hasn't, who hasn't fallen. Anyway, so that's the natural state of the soul, but the soul can unite with the spirit, and that's the, uh, the state of the bride and the bridegroom making love in the bridal chamber, which is obviously a beautiful image and uh, you know, very far from any uh, uh, dislike of sex, as far as I'm concerned. Right, so the happy ending is basically the soul being reunited with the bridegroom. Yes. Who represents the Savior, not the Father. Well, uh, uh, yes, or, or I would say more specifically the Spirit. I mean, um, the Spirit is also the Savior. I mean, th these things overlap. That's why they're told as myths rather than uh, defined as philosophy. I mean, and that's very obvious in the Hymn of the Pearl as well. And the Prince and the Pearl and the, uh, the robe of many colors that he had before he left his homeland and came down to Egypt, and which, to which he is restored when he goes back to Egypt, they all represent different aspects of the same thing. It's the, the seed is of what we are is sown into the world, and then we have to bring it back to fruition, so it goes back to, uh, uh, we can be restored to the pleroma, to the fullness again. Right, yeah, because some of the imagery is a little troubling, like uh, she's restored to her brother, and you start yeah, thinking, yeah, well, right. yuck. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, if you take it mythically, then it, you know, interchangeably with the husband and father and all that, uh, representing the spirit, then it's uh, more palatable. palatable. <laughs> yes, well, that's an interesting overlap with the Hymn of the Pearl. I mean, in the Exegesis, the bridegroom is also the uh, soul's brother. And in the Hymn of the Pearl, there's a mysterious older brother who remains in, the, uh, in Persia, in the homeland, while the younger brother, the prince, goes out to Egypt on his quest. So in, in a way, the older brother represents the same thing as the younger brother. It's, but it's the part of us that remains always in the Pleroma, and it's the potential of the spirit that is always, always there, that we, just, that we lose contact with, that we have to go down into the world uh, you know, both externally be incarnated and also um, internally we have to go through all the, uh, you know, the experience of having a soul in its lowest form. But there's some kind of feed, uh, reciprocal feeding there that uh, feeds back into the pleroma. So the, the pleroma and God is more than what it would have been before the fall occurred. I guess moving along to the Hymn of the Pearl, uh, you mentioned that it might have been Manichaean, and don't you mention that uh, it's the Hymn of the Pearl is also known in Islamic tradition? Yes, that, that was something I discovered uh, while I was researching the book. Um, I, actually, I found a story in one of Idris Shah's collections of Sufi stories, uh, which was somewhat similar. It wasn't the same story, but it had the same, the same sort of form to it. But then when I started to research a little bit more, um, uh, a scholar has recently discovered uh, versions of the Hymn of the Pearl, which really are the, the Hymn of the Pearl, not, uh, you know, not just parallel stories. Wow. It exists in four different Oriental languages. Um, I think there's Urdu, Arabic, Turkish, and one, o one other. And so it was well known in the Islamic tradition. I mean, of course, Manichaeism, Manichaeanism died out, and uh, the Acts of the Hymn of the Pearl was only preserved in two copies of the Acts of Thomas, you know, which I think were the monastery libraries. But it, it remained uh, part of a living tradition in the Islamic world. So it has the unusual distinction of being used by several different religions. Uh, we know it's used by Christians because it survived in the Acts of Thomas. We can, uh, I'm sure, you know, it was used by Gnostics. It was quite likely to be used by Manichaeans, if even even if it wasn't written by uh, a Manichaean author, uh, they produced, they uh, preserved a certain amount of the um, Thomasine literature. And Syria had a strong connection with uh, Manichaeanism too. Uh, Very so true. Lots of, and then Islam. Um, so it's, it's actually had a huge influence. And uh, it, because the Hymn of the Pearl wasn't part of the um, Nakhamadi collection, it actually... It reappeared in Western society in the 19th century through the efforts of uh, people like G.R.S. Mead, 
uh, philosophist and Gnostic scholar. And it became quite popular. Uh, Yeats referred to it. He, um, it had quite an influence in the literary world. And uh, even uh, I was digging into, uh, if, you, if you Google it, um, you can find um, song cycles have been written about the Hymn of the Pearl, you know, little mini operas and things. Wow. <laughs> it's an extra extra extraordinary influence that it's had for, you know, well over 100 years. Right. And can you give us a brief uh, account or a capsule of what's the story about? Yeah, sure. Um, there's a prince in Persia, or Parthia, is, uh, he's given a mission to go and retrieve the pearl from Egypt. And the pearl is uh, being guarded by a serpent. And uh, the prince has a robe, a robe of light that... Uh, he has to take off uh, before he goes on the quest. So he oh, goes down. Do you mind if I interrupt you really quick? You mentioned sure. it was a multicolored robe. Do you think this is drawing from the story of Joseph, or just a coincidence? It, it may be. I mean, it's not developed a great deal, but it does make one think of. I mean, think of the robe. I mean, in, um, in Genesis, it's a long-sleeved robe. In, in, in popular culture, it's the coat of many colors. But, right, that's true. Yeah. Okay, and then what happens to the prince? The hero leaves home, right? The and hero leaves home, yes. Campbell, he, Joseph Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. And he, ha he has a couple of guardians with him as well, escorting him along the way. Then he, um, he, he comes to the pearl with a serpent guarding it, uh, but he, uh, he doesn't find the opportunity to steal it. Instead, he... Uh, he goes and talks with the Egyptian people and becomes part of their, their world. And he, uh, he falls asleep and he, um, he forgets about his quest. And there are some odd little details that sometimes it's difficult to make sense of. But there's a companion from his uh, own country who's there. Right. And you, uh, you said it might have been Mani or somebody else said that? Yes, it has been argued that the whole thing has an autobiographical element to it. Um, I tend to think that's pushing it a bit, a bit too far, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I think probably the companion from his own old country is uh, just another aspect of this, the technique of the myth, where many characters or many um, objects represent the same thing, but they cast a different light on the uh, the theme of the myth. You know, like you have the, the old, mysterious older brother, you have the robe, uh, you have the the robe and the brother, they, they both stay in Parthia. But the pearl is in Egypt, and then there's this companion also in Egypt, and the, um, the prince who goes from one to the other and then back. So, that, so I think um, probably what it's getting at is just the way that we exist on different levels. You know, we have our souls, we have our spirits. The effort you know, is, is to re, uh, reunite the two and not to be... Uh, to awaken, not to be asleep, not to be seduced by the serpent. And so anyway, the um, prince, he forgets about his quest. He receives a letter from his home country um, uh, reminding him. And it's, and quite, it's quite a beautiful piece in itself, you know, telling him that he's fallen asleep and he, he's eaten. A, he, in fact, uh, the way that he um, fell asleep to all this is that he uh, ate of the food of the Egyptian, you know, I think means uh, consuming the... Uh, the outer aspect of the world, that sort of thing. So when when he receives the letter reminding him, which, which somewhat parallels the um, the father's forgiveness of the female soul and the exegesis, although they're very different views of the event. I think it's the same uh, you know, internal event that's being referred to. The um, uh, the female soul repents of what's happened to her and begs forgiveness, and she's forgiven by the father. Whereas the when the soul is a masculine figure. Uh, in fact, he doesn't repent. He's, he sent a letter from the, uh, you know, from the far country reminding him. So that I think these are different aspects of the same process going on. And then, as soon as he receives that, he, he nips off, uh, <laughs> kills the serpent, gets the pearl, and then goes back to his country where he's uh, welcomed with open arms. We haven't mentioned that so far, but there, there's quite a parallel between the hymn of the pearl and the the uh, parable of the prodigal son. And, and in both of them, there's the older brother. You know, in the prodigal son, 
prodigal son, he, he's, not, he's not really sent out on a quest. He leaves rather like the uh, female soul does. And he uh, finds himself uh, mired in um, you know, all the unfortunate circumstances uh, which have been described at great length in Sunday school. <laughs> but um, then he's returned and he's welcomed, he returns and he's welcomed with open arms and there's the older brother again there. Uh, and in the prodigal son, the older brother can't understand why the younger son is being welcomed so much because the older son is there the whole time. It's interesting that in all three of these, there's a brother. You know, there's the brother bridegroom and the exegesis, the uh, the older brother in the hymn of the pearl and the older brother in the prodigal son. It could be interesting, to, you know, to read these in parallel. It's all referring to the same process of fall and redemption. And uh, I guess a question that a, a Gnostic might have or a listener is, why do you think Egypt was made the land of the dead when it was the fountainhead of so many Gnostic schools? Well, Platonists, Hermetical, and all that. Well, well I think there are a couple of answers to that. Um, one is um, the um, historical answer. We might ask where the Hymn of the Pearl was written. And uh, Since uh, Parthia is the homeland, and the Egypt represents the fallen realm, um, we can say perhaps it was written in Parthia, in Persia, uh, which is uh, entirely possible if it was a Manichaean text. Because Manichaeanism uh, developed strongly in Persia. Um, so that's one possibility. You know, the home is uh, Persia. And in that case, of course, there may, as you mentioned, there may be an autobiographical element to it, that whoever the writer was had that experience of uh, going down to Egypt, which mirrored his uh, internal experience. Uh, but more psychologically, um, because Egypt in the Judaic and perhaps also in the Christian tradition, uh, you know, it's the land uh, from which our people must be freed. You know, the Exodus was from Egypt. Uh, people were put into slavery in Egypt in the Jewish tradition. And then in the Gospels, of course, in the, the whole Holy Family went down to Egypt. And then That's true. they came back. To uh, Galilee, yes. So that's uh, one element, uh, and, and, and also a third aspect of that. Um, if you want to represent the world as being in a fallen state, the world that we know, you know, apart from uh, the uh, master tradition or the other traditions which are trying to free us from that, uh, the logical thing is to use one's own circumstances as an, as an illustration for that. So I, I actually, even though there might be reasons to um, take this as an indication that uh, the Hymn of the Pearl was written by a party and, and it's autobiographical. I, I can also see that um, it could have been written by some, an Egyptian, somebody who lived in Egypt, who wanted to represent the world as he knew it as being in the fallen state. Ah, oh, very good. It's just like in The Matrix. I mean, um, The Matrix doesn't uh, represent, you know, the world of The Matrix isn't, and to represent Russia or Iraq or you know, some enemy of America. It's an American city. Right, very true. Yeah. So, I mean, perhaps in 2,000 years' time, some people are saying, oh, it's probably written by an Iraqi because it represents America <laughs> 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 as being an illusory place. But, right, uh, <laughs> good point. <laughs> so, you know, each of those different theories can cast a different light on the, you know, different aspects of the hymn. Right, and Parthia might have seemed an exotic land. The outside lands are always more exotic. So, yeah, yeah. good point. Good point. There's, there's, and there's also an interesting dating issue there that um, Parthian dynasty was deposed in around uh, 220 AD. Uh, again, if we can take that as historical, that would um, set the hymn of the pearl before, uh, you know, in the, probably in the late second century or early third century. Oh, but I'm always a, always a bit suspicious of some of that reasoning because uh, it always seems a little bit literal to me. But um, anyway, that's a possibility for the dating of the hymn of the pearl. And, and what about the exegesis of the soul? What is the dating on that, uh, in your opinion? A similar period. Um, the, the, the excerpts from Hebrew scripture that are included uh, overlap with what we know of some... Um, um, anthologies of Hebrew scripture, of excerpts of Hebrew scripture that existed in Alexandria. Um, you, you know, so the, these were um, 
you know, not epitomies, but uh, anth anthologies of selections from scripture that were fairly well known at the time. So if that's true, then um, again, around the end of the second century, early third century, uh, be a reasonable uh, time frame for the writing of the exegesis. And, and again, Alexandria is a good possibility because of the meeting of cultures that we see here. It interprets the Hebrew Bible allegorically according to its scheme of the soul. And also Homer, that's, um, that's quite interesting, that uh, the Odyssey is interpreted as being a tale of the, the fall and return of the soul. Very true. Okay, and uh, to end, uh, and uh, I definitely highly recommend Gnostic Writings on the Soul to the listeners, and uh, long overdue that uh, somebody's out there tackling other Gnostic scriptures. But uh, what else do you have in the works, Andrew? Uh, well, I have an introduction to Gnosticism lined up for Watkins Publishing in England, and I'm looking forward to that. I, I want to go into, um, I mean, there's some, been some excellent overviews of uh, general Gnostic thought recently, but um, many of them only give a chapter or two to the Gnostics themselves, some of the ancient Gnostics. So I want to really dig into the um, ancient Gnostics, look, look at possible practices, uh, look at the individuals, and, and just you know, question a lot of the uh, received wisdom about the Gnostics. But I'll also follow the story through to the Manichaeans, Paulicians, Pogamils, uh, Cathars, and then a, a nod in, to further Gnostic traditions and uh, modern traditions. And then a Gnostic dictionary for Quest Publishing, uh, which is long overdue. There's no really definitive Gnostic dictionary out there. So no, uh, you, you can find them online, but yes, it's, it would be nice to have a book. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, there's some nice things online. Uh, but um, it's amazing, you know, after 200 years of... Uh, investigations into Gnostic thought. We still don't have <laughs> a uh, reasonable Gnostic dictionary out there. Right, right. Well, uh, you might want to wait because you know I'll be bugging you to come back on as soon as those books are out, so beware. Oh, <laughs> I'll enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, well, I always enjoy having you on, Andrew, and uh, again, uh, thanks for coming back a third time, and uh, we'll be talking soon. Sure, thanks. All right, have a good yeah. day. I am stretched on your grave and will lie there forever with your hands held.